For hundreds of years, humans have retold legends of cryptids like Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. Mermaids, yetis, on very rare occasion, they turn out to actually exist. You might be surprised to find out that one of these real cryptids is the okapi, the kind of half horse, half zebra looking animal from Central Africa. For decades, stories of this cryptic animal were told through the grapevine, often shrugged off as nonsense, sometimes led to failed expeditions to find them, until one day, their existence was finally revealed to science. At the surface, this probably seems like a straightforward adventure discovery, but boy oh boy, does it go much deeper than that. This story has context and surprises I had no idea about before I reached research for this video. So buckle up, because today we're going to get into all of it while I tell you the story of how the Okapi went from rumor to reality. All right, before we get into it, I added a couple things I'm not really sure about, to be honest. I literally just put them up like 10 minutes ago. This used to be in my kitchen, and I replaced it with a sign that says whiskey bar, which I like very much. So I decided it might look cool in here, but I don't know. Also this, I don't know. I know I said I was going to put it up. I finally did. I feel like it might be a little bit too small. I don't know if I'm gonna keep it. Let me know what you think. I know if I do keep it, I need to add more shit. And so it might just look uncomfortable and awkward for a second until I find more shit to put up here. But yeah, I don't know. Also, hey, Kraken. Hey, isn't that perfect for a real cryptids video? That was not planned. Anyway, let's get the general information out of the way. By starting off with defining what a cryptid actually is. As you might know, this isn't my first episode of Real Cryptids, but it's the first one I've done in like three fucking years. So I figured we should start from scratch. In modern pop culture, a cryptid is basically any creature that's rumored to exist, but there's no actual evidence. Bigfoot is the poster child cryptid, the Loch Ness Monster, the Jersey Devil, Mothman, etc. There's stories and apparently sightings, but no confirmed specimens. For a long time, the Okapi was in that club. As such a classic example of a cryptid that today, the official seal of the International Society of Cryptozoology actually features in Okapi, right next to the Loch Ness Monster. Oh wait, that's not the Loch Ness Monster. Scratch that. Don't put that in. Right next to the Loch Ness Monster and Sasquatch. I know that doesn't really make any sense. They seem kind of like too much of a normal animal, like giant squid. There it is. That's the one. Sure. Giant squid. That seems insane and more outrageous that it's not a cryptid. The fact that this has turned out to be not this image, but the exist, well, and not that size either, and not an octopus. But you know what I'm saying? I don't need to explain that. Anyway, it's outrageous that a giant squid exists and is not a cryptid. I feel like I've lost my point. <laughs> the point is, an okapi seems like just another cool looking animal, cool looking ungulate, among the vastness of the other cool looking ungulates. Nothing more to see there. Which makes the fact that their existence wasn't believed at first seem so bizarre. Like if you know zebra, oryx, kudu exist, and you're going to a new region for the first time and hear about a donkey looking animal with a patch of stripes, I feel like the natural thing would be like, oh, hell yeah, another cool animal. Not. That's insane, you're insane, you don't know what you're talking about. But I'm getting ahead of myself because, yeah, I have to give you the context of where this mystery was taking place. 1800s, Central Africa, specifically the Congo. In the 1800s, the Congo was a magnet for European travelers, explorers, scientists, hunters, missionaries, you name it. For them as outsiders, it had this dangerous allure, a massive, mysterious, almost completely unmapped heart of Africa, filled with rumors of lost civilizations and strange animals waiting to be found in the jungle. But for the Congolese, this was an invasion. The flood of exploration and later colonization brought disaster for the Congolese people. European powers treated the Congo as a treasure chest to take for themselves, dividing it up on maps, stripping it for ivory and rubber, and imposing forced labor on entire communities. Their wildlife was being hunted relentlessly to sell and study back home. And that is literally just the tip of the iceberg. This is super relevant for this story and is also relevant to this day. Right now, the region is facing one of the world's largest humanitarian crises. Waves of violence and conflict have displaced millions of Congolese people, and tens of millions struggle to access food, clean water, and basic health care. A very big part of this is due to Western exploitation that persists there for access to valuable materials that power the device you're probably using to watch this video right now. If you haven't heard of this crisis or want to learn more, I put some resources in the description of some videos you can watch, stuff you can read, and how you can help. So it's the 18 1800s and Europeans are exploring the Congo on a large scale for the first time. They were meeting groups of Congolese people who obviously had a lot of knowledge to share about their home. And for decades, they told them about a strange animal lurking in the forest. One people rarely saw, but had plenty of stories about. Locals had a few different names for it. Ati, Ndumbe, Okapi, etc. They described it as a shy creature with stripes that slipped in and out of the shadows of the forest. The Europeans found these descriptions baffling. Maybe they're describing some sort of zebra or donkey, or was it something else entirely? The tales didn't match up with anything they'd ever seen. And as they started making their way into the forest, 
obsessed with finding and describing new African species, colonizers tended to dismiss the ecological knowledge these indigenous tribes were trying to provide for them. Entire books were written speculating on these undiscovered or cryptic animals of Central Africa, which were the Europeans' own takes on the descriptions given to them by locals, and the descriptions were off a lot of the time. There were books on rumors about unicorns, one-horned beasts called abada, and jungle giraffes. Early on, there were some pieces of striped skin circulating, which you might expect to be seen as a solid piece of evidence, but a lot of people dismissed them as fake, maybe stitched together from different animals, or that it was just some variant of an animal already found. For example, sometime around 1884, Wilhelm Junker, a wealthy physician turned explorer was traveling the Congo when locals handed him a strange piece of striped hide. They called the animal they got it from Makapi and Junker dismissed it, figuring it was some sort of musk deer they already knew about, not realizing he was holding a key piece of the Okapi mystery, but that went nowhere. Then in 1889, a French army officer named Captain Jean-Baptiste Marchand, probably, wrote in his journal about seeing this stunning yet skittish animal by a riverbank in Central Africa. An animal he couldn't find in any zoology book. He figured it was some unknown antelope. That didn't really go anywhere either. The best clue came from Sir Henry Morton Stanley, who spent years exploring Central Africa for King Leopold II of Belgium. King Leopold II was a key, horrific player in this story. If you've never heard of him, for now, I can just say, at the time, the Congo was his private property. So, in 1876, Stanley found pieces of striped skin in the Ituri forest, which his Congolese interpreters said came from a forest donkey. In his book, In Darkest Africa, Stanley talked about a shy animal called Ati that ate leaves and was sometimes caught by Wambuti hunters in pits. An informant from the local group said the Ati looked just like a donkey and was prized for its meat. But again, Stanley never saw one himself in the flesh. But that brief mention set off a chain reaction because it inspired Harry Johnston, a British colonial administrator and zoologist who read Stanley's book. Johnston talked to Stanley before heading to Uganda in 1899 and became determined to find anything that would prove the Okapi is real. The following year, a group of Mbuti people who lived in the Ituri forest were kidnapped by German smugglers to be displayed as part of a human zoo exhibit at the Paris World Fair. Human zoos where indigenous people from Africa, Asia, and the Americas were put on display in Europe and North America were unfortunately very common in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The Belgian authorities asked Johnston to help them return the kidnapped Mbuti to their home in the Ituri forest, and he agreed. In the process, he built a relationship with them and started asking about the Ati he heard about from Stanley's book. The Mbuti told him there really was a large animal with a dark brown body and striped legs, what they called Oapi. His quest was finally starting to come together. He made a pit stop at Fort Mbeni in the Semliki Forest, which was a post commanded by British colonial officer, Lieutenant Miura. The Lieutenant gave Johnston two bandoliers, these big belts that had been made out of some sort of striped hide for soldiers in the Bambuba tribe. The Bambuba called the source of this hide Okapi. Johnson was so excited about finding more evidence that this animal existed and he organized an expedition immediately. He brought Mbuti guides to follow the animal's tracks, but what they identified confused him even more. The Okapi tracks didn't match any zebra, donkey, or horse he'd know, which have single hooves. Instead, these tracks had two toes. He was perplexed and thought the Mbuti were trying to bamboozle him. And after just a couple days, Johnston was slapped with malaria. The whole team was. He was devastated and escorted back to Uganda. The trip was over, mission unsuccessful. But Lieutenant Miura promised to help finish his quest, and Johnston was able to ship those initial striped bandoliers to Europe for analysis, and finally things started picking up speed. Then, in November 1900, Dr. P.L. Slater, who was the secretary of the Zoological Society of London, received a bag with a letter and two strips of brown and white striped skin. The letter explained these bandoliers had been cut from the hide of an unknown animal by soldiers in the Congo. Dr. Slater had never seen anything like it. Under the microscope, the hair sort of matched both zebra and and giraffe, but didn't fit antelope and didn't line up with anything already in the books. He showed the strips at a meeting of the Zoological Society that December, and boom, the press was in a frenzy. Evidence of a new, decently large animal in Africa was the new hot goss. What is this, some sort of sick joke? How could a big animal go unseen for so long? Especially by European scientists, they said. Was it a donkey with stripes? A forest zebra? An antelope or a musk deer? The legendary unicorn? Maybe even a missing link to some ancient extinct species? They wanted this mystery animal pronto. How soon could this new beast be bagged and put on display? With only these skin strips to go off of, the Zoological Society described it as a new horse and zebra relative, and gave it the species name Equus John Johnston I in February 1901. At the same time, back in Uganda, Sir Harry Johnston was anxiously waiting to hear from Lieutenant Miura, hoping at least he was successful in their relay mission. But he wasn't. He died of Blackwater fever. Luckily though, the mission was passed to Miura's second in command. Carl Erickson, and in February 1901, Erickson sent Johnston not just a skin, but also two skulls, one larger, one smaller, with a note that said the animal's hooves were bluish black and split in two, 
like those of antelopes and goats. What do you know? The Mbuti were not bamboozling him. When Johnston finally examined the skulls in April, he realized what he had was not a zebra, not a horse, not an antelope. Structurally, the animal's closest relative was the giraffe. Yeah, maybe even a living descendant of something super ancient like Helatotherium. Who would have guessed this shy, mysterious, forest donkey of the Congo could actually be a giraffe relative. Johnson immediately sent the skin, skulls, and a watercolor reconstruction to England, and that second package caused even more stir in London. In May, they were presented at the next Zoological Society meeting. Johnson was there again in June, telling the bizarre story behind the font, and proposed the name Palatotherium tigranum, thinking it was a close relative of the already known prehistoric Helatotherium. The whole scientific name roughly translated to tiger-striped Greek beast, but that name didn't stick either. After even further study of the specimens, Sir E. Ray Lancaster of the British Museum of Natural History proposed this was not a living Helatotherium species, but a new genus entirely, and re-described it as Okapia johnstoni, Okapia after the local name, and johnstoni in honor of Johnston. The Okapi was formally placed with the giraffes, not the horses, and recognized as its own unique thing, brethren of living giraffes, and a cousin to some extinct lineages like Helatotherium. The Okapi had gone from rumor to reality, a scientific sensation, icon of the jungle. So what do we know now? Well, luckily we've learned a lot more about them in the last hundred years. The Okapi is a relatively large ungulate found in the rainforests of the Northeastern and Central Democratic Republic of the Congo, or the DRC. Sometimes, very rarely, found just across the border in Uganda. They get to about eight feet long and five feet tall at the shoulder, which is like here. Females get bigger than the males, which is always very exciting. The largest females are almost 800 pounds and the largest males are like 550. So despite their fairly massive size, they're pretty rare to see in the wild due to the denseness of the jungle and their conspicuous nature. Very secretive, very elusive. They're actually so elusive that the first photo of a wild okapi didn't happen until 2008. That's crazy. And that was only from a camera trap, so it had to be bamboozled to get the photo. But what's not elusive is that fucking tongue. It gets to about a foot long and is bluish black, like a blackberry fruit roll up, if there was such a thing. And it's prehensile so they can use it to grab on the leaves or to eat, but also for to clean their own eyes and ears. Their tongue might remind you of something. Yeah, a giraffe. What you were thinking of is a giraffe. And like I said, it just so happens that giraffes seem to be their closest living relatives, so much so that they are considered to be in the giraffe family. Giraffity, which makes them giraffids. Most scientists agree they share a common ancestor that was alive like 11.5 million years ago, but there's still some debate. Some researchers argue that the Okapi's reproductive system, traits as a fetus, and even its bile acids make it weirdly more like a bovid than a giraffe. Bovids are like antelope, cattle, bison, goats, etc. And those researchers argue Okapis are instead more specifically related to the Nilgai antelope. Is that how you pronounce it? Nilgai. Yeah, the largest antelope in Asia that we know of. Personally, I had never heard of the Nilgai antelope before researching this video, but I like them. I like their energy. It's very bulldog-esque. I guess they were introduced to a ranch in Texas in the 1920s and have since spread throughout the area. So now they're in Texas as well. But that's a video for another day. But the general consensus is they're in the giraffid club that exists in the shadows of their giraffe cousins in every way possible, physically, they're smaller, metaphorically, more elusive, historically, geographically, etc. The weird similarities to bovids are probably just yet another example of nature not giving shit to you straight. Fossil records of okapis are basically non-existent, which makes sense considering they live in places where fossils don't preserve well. The only known fossils are pretty recent, dating to the Pleistocene, with some debated finds from the Pliocene in Uganda. Some scientists call the Okapi a living fossil that has changed very little evolutionarily, because they found a niche within a dense forest that, for some reason, just wasn't challenged much evolutionarily. And actually, a lot of prehistoric giraffids have skeletons similar to the Okapi, so a lot of them are reconstructed as such. Paleotragus. Cebatherium, etc. The giraffe family goes back like 15 to 25 million years ago, with Canthumurex being one of the earliest representatives of this group, found in what is now Libya. They had the build of a slender antelope, or about the size of a fallow deer, but had the teeth characteristic of the giraffe family. A couple of other prehistoric giraffids are Georgiomurex, Samotherium, Giraffocaryx. Obviously, a lot of fun shit going on in this lineage. Today, Okapis are found only in the rainforests of northeastern and central DRC, and rarely nearby Uganda, like I mentioned before. Their historic range used to cover a large part of the central and eastern Congo Basin. This is mostly due to habitat loss, poaching, and political instability. But one thing that has kept Okapi populations and other animal populations separated for millions of years is the Congo River itself. Rivers like the Congo can act like a wall, and the diversity on each side can be insanely different if they stay separated for long enough. Exhibit A. The Congo has kept chimps and bonobos evolving separately for a million years. And smaller animals, like the tiny little mice in genus Praomys, you bet your ass the genetics are very different on one side 
side of the river and the other. Those bitches are not getting across to genetically mix. And with Okapis, genetic studies have tracked how their mitochondrial DNA splits into six distinct lineages, some separated for up to 1.7 million years. It looks like their population history has depended on the river setup, the splitting and fragmenting that happened during the climate fluctuations in the Pleistocene. So. That's pretty cool. Okapis are very particular about what they eat. They live in the dense forests where their zebra stripes serve as camouflage in the low light filtering through the trees. It gets a bit dark. Despite this, they specifically like the young leaves of plants that the sun hits via clearings and light gaps. Must be the most delicious. I don't know. They've also been seen eating clay, charcoal, probably for essential vitamins and minerals not found in leaves. Their social life is a bit dull. They're not strictly solitary, but don't form herds. Genetic and radio collar studies show their ranges often overlap, especially with males looking for mating opportunities, but they don't officially pair up. So I guess kind of like, what do they call it today? Parallel play, where you do shit alone, but near a friend, like, I don't know, when two people sit on separate phones watching TikTok and shit, I don't know. So I know what you're thinking. Damn, likes to be semi alone, in the dark, picky, easily startled. Yeah, kind of sounds like you. Couple other things about Okapis, females are pregnant for 426 days and give birth to a baby that's usually around 48 pounds. Here is a picture of a baby Okapi for your records. Just so cute, it's stupid. And also, weirdly, babies don't shit for the first one to two months of their life. Yeah. Probably an adaptation to avoid being detected by predators. Pretty fucking weird. Pretty cool. Also, their eyes can be pulled back into their sockets, and each eye has this membrane which helps to keep it clean and moist. The Okapi is classified as endangered by the IUCN. Unfortunately, their numbers have plummeted by more than 50% in the last 24 years, mostly due to habitat loss, poaching, and political instability. Current wild population estimates range from just a few thousand to maybe 10,000. Nobody really knows for sure. But conservation efforts are happening there. In 1987, the Okapi conservation project was established and helped set aside an Okapi wildlife reserve, which is cool, but it's very tough to protect in a region with so much conflict. And that's what needs to be the focus right now. People in the Congo Basin are currently facing one of the world's largest humanitarian crises. There's ongoing fighting between armed groups and the government, and it's forced millions of people from their homes. Over 25 million Congolese need urgent help because of the violence, hunger, disease outbreaks, and lost access to basic services. Entire communities have been uprooted, and families are trying to survive in overcrowded camps or regions with little support. And like I said earlier, if you're watching this video, you're already deeply tied to the Congo. The cobalt that powers our phones, laptops, electric cars, and batteries is primarily mined in this region, often through really horrific and exploitative labor practices. Tens of thousands of children and adults are working in dangerous, often illegal mines with very little safety and almost no protection. If you haven't heard of any of this, it makes sense. It's not getting a lot of mainstream coverage. So I put together a list of resources you can use to start learning more in the description. There's also a list of ways you can get involved to help. Check it out, spread the word however you can. Also, I am absolutely no expert on this, so if you have any other resources to provide to the list, or maybe some to switch out, let me know. And yeah, I hope it's helpful. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of the... I think it's the evolution of us after this. Yep, evolution of us four that we know of. Coming out next week. Keep up with behind the scenes content, live streams, polls for videos, and a Discord server on Patreon. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya!